Chair, you are live. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Chair Katie Cornell. I'd like to invite you or welcome you to the February 2022 meeting of the Public Art and Cultural Commission. The Public Art and Cultural Commission, originally called the Public Art Board, was established by the City of Asheville in 2000. This nine-member commission serves as an advisory board to the city on matters concerning public art in public spaces. The commission is responsible for promoting public art in the city, overseeing the city's public art projects, and ensuring the art displays in public buildings and public spaces in the city of Asheville are properly maintained. All committee members and staff are participating virtually. We're streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link on the front page of the city's website and on the city's YouTube page. To participate by phone, dial 855-925-2801, meeting code 9182. You can send public comments to Public Art and Cultural Commission at publicinput.com. Again, that's Public Art and Cultural Commission at publicinput.com. I will now go through and introduce all the committee members who are participating virtually. Please make sure to mute your microphone if you're not speaking. Um, if you have a question or would like to speak, un unmute your microphone and remember to mute when you're done speaking. Committee members, as I call your name, please say a quick hello. Shirley Whitesides. Shirley was here. Hello. Oh, Everyone. hey, Shirley. Okay. Allie McGee. Hi. Andrew Fletcher. Good afternoon. Pete Perez. Hello. Um, Marcia Almodovar. Hello. I don't believe Joanna has is with us. Joanna Haggerty. Reggie Tidwell, I don't think is joined us. Yeah, I'm here, everybody. Oh, hey, Reggie. Welcome. And um, we know Jasmine Washington is unable to make it today. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with our administrative items. Um, the first item on our agenda is to consider the adoption of our minutes from our annual retreat. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes? If so, uh, can I get a motion to approve? I'll move. Pete has moved. Do I have a second? Second by Shirley Whitesides. Shirley has seconded. I will now do a roll call vote to approve the minutes. Um, so, Shirley. Present. Uh, you approve the minutes. Um, Ali McGee. Yes. Andrew. Aye. Pete. Aye. Marsha. Aye. Reggie. Approve. And I also approve. So the minutes are passed. Um, we're going to move on forward to our continued business. Um, and talk about the Pack Square Improvement Project. So I'm going to hand it over to our staff liaison, Steph Hunsendahl. Hey, thank you, Chair Cornell. Um, great meeting uh, last time. Everyone, as you could see from your minutes, we're working on actually transcribing and getting some notes that prioritize your thoughts together. But there is one link in there. Wanted to make sure that you paid attention to that um, goes directly to the wrap-up discussion. So that is a really good thing for you, even during this meeting, to check out and say, okay, let me, let's remind ourselves what felt really important by the time we ended that three-hour journey um, last month. I wanted to give you an update on the request for proposals for the PAC Square Improvement Project. First, um, Thank you so much to Allie McGee for reminding us last time that it would be great to reiterate every time we talk about what the project is and what the timeline is and how much money we have, all of those wonderful things. So I'm going to do that for our um, for commission and also anyone that is watching. So the Pack Square Improvements Project is going to be a six to nine month community engagement and urban planning project where at the end we will have a vision document that gives us an idea of how we think Pack Square Plaza, that's our center public urban square, not the entire park, but just that center public urban square, 
how that plaza could be more equitable and inclusive in the future. This project is a continuation of the work of the Vance Monument Task Force but um, it also goes beyond just looking at the monument. It's an opportunity for us to look at how we express ourselves as a community over time uh, through other uh, pieces of public art, memorials, and also just the way that we design public spaces so that they're welcoming to other people. The request for proposals that we have on the street right now is to hire a project manager to help us go through that process. At the end of that process, that vision document will have a set of recommendations that can help us move along to some next steps. And we will have built some cons consensus and some partnerships that will get us there. I'm happy to introduce a new member of the team today. So um, Ricardo, can you wave your hand? For a second. Um, Ricardo is going to be on our um, PAC Square Improvements team, and I'm going to give him the floor right now to introduce himself and to tell you what it is that he does for the city. Thank you very much, Stephanie. My name is Ricardo Asurto, and I'm the new communication specialist at the city of Asheville. I'll be working directly with all of you in this project, and I'm really excited to be contributing to this work to the great work of the city and the community. Thank you so much. So we we're gonna we're gonna have this wonderful um, assortment of people from the city, from the county. We're also applying to get some Moorhead Kane scholars do some work with us, and we're looking at bringing in Kayla. So we would even have youth in the high school age range, um, and we're gonna talk about that on Monday. So that's an update for you as well, because I know youth engagement was something that y'all brought up as really important um, last time. So we did extend the deadline for the request for proposals. It is now due this coming Monday at 5 p.m. We wanted to do that because we heard some feedback from community members and also other staff members that we wanted to give people a little bit more time and perhaps not have it be due on a Friday uh, where a lot of people who might have other jobs are working and maybe have it due on a Monday where people had a weekend to put a proposal together. So as a reminder, there'll be a lot of other opportunities to get community engagement, urban design, planners, communication people, graphic designers, and all those other folks on board. There's going to be a lot of um, opportunities um, in, in the future. But um, we, um, we are first starting with like a project manager and the basics with that. So um, does anybody have any questions about that? The deadline's been extended is the main piece. And if you want, Chair, I can just go right into this next piece, which is going to, I'm going to start off and then I'm going to let Andrew manage the discussion, if that's okay. So. Okay. So one of the things that I walked away with from our meeting last time was a question that Andrew posed, which uh, was a response to Katie saying, we should get some baseline information. And he said, well, what do we already have or no? What kind of data sets do, do we have? And I started thinking about this question and I realized I wanted to provide some information to you um, first on a national scale. So you learned from Carly Stevenson about Monument Lab and they're basically pioneering and leading the way, talking about the way um, communities can change how we view monuments and other um, objects of power and immense pres presence in our communities. So they released um, over a year ago now, I believe, it was a national monument, it's called a National Monument Audit, and this is online. And um, what they did was aggregate data from across uh, the United States and also territories from different data sets to kind of take a look at what monuments and memorials we have as a nation. Um, there is a huge uh, section just on the methodology alone, um, and it's very, very interesting. But I wanted to show you a little bit of just what it looks like visualized in a map. So 
So on a map, you can actually go through some of this and they'll, they they have cleaned out some of this uh, data. It's not going to have every single monument memorial, but it has a representative um, cross section of monuments memorial from um, all over the place. And if you go to Asheville, North Carolina, these are the, the places or these are the monuments that they've listed. Obviously, we have a lot more, but they really, um, they, they link to the source. If you guys know Commemorative Landscapes in North Carolina, um, this is, uh, it's a resource through UNC Chapel Hill. It has a lot of stuff on it that might be of interest to you. But I, I'm picking out this one in particular because I didn't know who Colonel Creaseman is. So you can actually go into this and you can figure out where Colonel Creaseman um, monument is. And I was like, oh, it's in some cemetery. It's really interesting. Is it really a monument? But as I read through this, what it says is that this monument originally sat in front of Buncombe County Courthouse at Pack Square in downtown Asheville. And it was right next to the Thomas Klingman Monument and relocated into the 1970s. And um, so I'll, sh I'll share this with you. If you can see that, this is the record, right? So here's where it says that piece on it. So there's a lot of pretty interesting information that we could be um, delving into. And I know our friends at um, Buncombe County Special Collection are really interested in this piece um, as, as well, um, that they could help us figure out like what has have monuments and memorials look like over time. So getting back to this to this map, this is a big data source for us to just kind of think about the, the, um, the ways that we might start looking at what we know and what we have. And the process that they used uh, to look at this data is a lot like what you were all talking about last month, which is, you know, we're entering into this kind of exploration phase. We need to gather some information and connect with people and then analyze what we have and um, and share that out potentially into like a vision document. This is also very interesting finding from um, the study, which is these are the top 50 individuals um, that are memorialized through monuments in the United States based on this data set. And you probably don't recognize all of them, but you probably recognize that they are primarily male and primarily white. Also, here's their names. So um, just curious how many people know who Casimir Pulaski is, number seven. If you're from Illinois, um, you know who he is because they have a Casimir Pulaski day. Um, but a lot of us probably don't, and that's probably interesting to see, like, wow, this person got a, a, a lot of monuments and memorials. But you can also see Robert, Robert E. Lee, number six. So interesting findings. And what we want to start doing is making those connections between what are you seeing on a national level and how are people managing that with what we see here in Asheville. So these were their key findings sifting through all the data. Um, monuments have always changed and they define change in a lot of different ways. An example that they give is, you know, like there have been many names that have been added to the Vietnam uh, Memorial in, uh, on the mall in Washington, D.C. Um, in our case, we can look and say, wow, well, there's a monument uh, uh, to Colonel Creaseman that used to sit in Pack Square and now um, basically serves as a gravestone out in West Asheville. The monument landscape is overwhelmingly white and male. We heard that already. Most common features of American monuments reflect war and conquest. And um, a lot to what Shirley Whitesides has been saying to us, you know, the story of that what we tell is not the true story of our community. So they actually break down each one of those um, four findings and provide stats and visualizations. Here's the one for that number four, some data on there. It basically says that, um, you know, only 3% of the recorded Confederate monuments mention the word defeat on the monument. So, you know, these records they have are um, the, the ones that they used, those records had to be absolutely complete. And so they only used about 60,000 records, um, which was just a small percentage of the original data set that they sifted through. 
Here's some more information on that fourth finding. Um, uh, it shows again, the on the left hand, what you're seeing is like out of the 1,690 monuments that were Confederate, only 3% mentioned defeat. So they're showing you in a visual way um, how kind of off the narratives are in um, on a national level. So what do we have and how off are we on our narrative? Here's just a few of the pieces of um, history, public art, memorials, monuments, things that we use to express our, our culture and our, our world, our, our community that are in and around Pack Square. So what Andrew and I were thinking is maybe we might wanna do a little bit of an inventory and audit here. And I linked something in your agenda that should be helpful. And this is actually something that was pulled from it. Let me share this so you can see it. Um, this is the start of an inventory. It has many of the pieces of public art that are in and around Pack Square written. Some things don't have the artist in them, et cetera, and so forth. There's some lists in here that I put up. Um, some new things that are going to be in Pack Square that we should probably record. And um, Andrew has an idea to maybe um, geolocate some of these. We do have a GIS layer, layer that we can do that with, not a problem. Don't know if, if we need to talk about this. Many of you probably don't even know that there is a historic marker to photographer George Ma Massa coming up. And then um, we also have started this right here, which is just um, that of course, in our public realm, there are other pieces of public art other than what the city has. So the Ode to Buskers and Asheville music piece, which is right next to Pack Square, um, Reflections on Unity, which is in front of the Asheville Art Museum. All of these things also make up a good bit of what our public realm and landscape is saying to us. And at this point, I am gonna ask Andrew, to talk a little bit about what he thinks maybe we could do to um, get from zero to 60. Uh, thanks, Steph. I appreciate um, all that info. And uh, just it's really interesting to hear about the monuments that have moved, as in it's sort of like kind of a normal thing um, for monuments to come and go. There's a normal attrition rate. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, uh, so... As far as like where do we go from here, I think that <coughs> obviously we have to be on site. Oh, excuse me, guys. <clears throat> and so a couple of questions would be: Do we <coughs> go out? Do we go out on site as a full meeting of the commission, or as like a working group of a few of us that want to work together on this? <coughs> and I'd also like to see if we could get from the city side if we could get really a nice a nice printout map of this that we could use to sort of highlight locate on the printout who <coughs> this is this and then um uh, take a photo of it and go from there <coughs> <coughs> coughing fit horribly timed sorry y'all um uh, and uh the other the other thing i think that we should do on this is um, what I looking at the monument audit, the plaque dedicated to Zebulon Vance is a separate item. So we should kind of think about how, um, uh, you know, how fine grained we should get with these. Is the monument and the plaque this one item or two? Monument audit says two. So I I think uh, I like that approach of um of uh, making it that fine grained. So uh, yeah, who's in and uh, shall we, and I, I think this is a better question for the chair, shall we use this as a regular meeting of PAC or shall we get a non-quorum amount together uh, that wants to volunteer and do this? I'm happy to do either way. I would, you know, ask members how involved they want to be. Um, I think, you know, when we did our field trip of downtown, we only made it to a fraction of spots. It takes a lot more time. Uh, than we thought. And so I think it would definitely have to be more than just one meeting for sure. Um, and it might be, you know, we break into groups and and spread out in the area. What are your thoughts of other committee members? 
I'm wondering if it makes sense to just split up the work. I, I mean, it, it's not, is, it, is it the kind of, by what you're envisioning being laying out, is it the kind of thing that one person could do one piece and cover it? Or are you looking to be able to have more than one person with eyes on and, and recording and capturing what it is? Um, I think that a, a small team, if we, you know, let's say that we could break into teams of a city staff person and one or two volunteers together um, to, to, uh, to take different uh, corners of, uh, to take different sections of the, the project scope area. That's another thing I think we should discuss is the scope, because um, this could get real big and real out of hand really quick. So, um, uh, you know, if we want to, if we want to uh, sort of, you know, think about how big the box is that we're going to be looking at. Um, I think that's that'll be important. That that'll inform kind of how how we should go from there. Actually, um, but any 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 thoughts, or should I just kind of take a stab at this? I would say that I like the idea of the small groups because, as you remember from our field trip, we got so much more out of it from our discussion mm -hmm. uh, that we had around each piece. Uh, that I think a lot would be missed if it was just one person going through and checking off boxes. Yeah, I think so too. That's my that's my experience. Is uh, you know, teamwork is really helpful. We can more than double the output. Um, so uh, yeah, I imagine that we would meet at the uh, you know, meet at the uh, in front of the art museum, and then break into some teams, try to distribute the the talent and the skills uh, into a few groups, depending on how many were there, and then um, head off and um, head off in our different directions and see how much we can get done in in, uh, in an hour. Hey, Andrew, when the downtown commission did like the parking space survey, mm -hmm. how did, how did that work? I wasn't um, actually on the ground for that one. So, but I did receive the reports and talk to people who did that. Um, and that was, they literally just walked around and documented um, places where, you know, they'd say like, Hey, there's room for a car here, but um, there's not a parking space here. Or uh, this is a loading zone and it, um, you know, so they would, they just walked around and took pictures and documented this, did a fantastically thorough job of that. And it really showed that there was a lot of flexibility, um, that was built into the parking that we kind of didn't imagine, but when you saw it all there, so that could definitely be a model for what, for what we're doing. Um, but that parking audit was, that was big. It took a lot of time for those folks. Um, and so, uh, if, if this is a, if this effort is useful and helpful and efficient, then I think it, we could easily sort of copy and paste it to other parts of the city. Um, but uh, so I, I, it might be good for us to think of it like that going in um, to see how modular and uh, buildable that we could, we could create uh, such a system um, and just how, how best to um, link up with uh, what, how city staff are going to find this useful too. So um, that I think those are all things that we want to have, um, well thought out going in. Um, we're just looking at doing the pack plaza area right. to begin. Yeah, okay. yeah. But I would, I would, um, uh, I would hate to build something that we couldn't expand. Uh, oh yeah. You know, like I, like we don't have to make the scope big, but I, I would, I think it would be smart for us to, um, uh, to uh, build, uh, make it so that it's extendable when we need or want it to be. Yeah, I definitely think that's doable in a day. I don't think it can be done in an hour, but it, can, you know, definitely be done. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> like a three I mean, four-hour chunk. Yeah, and and uh, if you had, you know, let's say you had three groups of three, um, uh, I bet in an hour you could get a lot done, um, or just or be able to highlight what's what you have to go back and mop up. Um, uh, but uh, that's that's. I mean, I think that would be, if we had three groups of three, I would call that I would call that a successful. Um, day of work and maybe some of us could work longer maybe some of us are, are or have a you know a shorter day you know we can be flexible if we do it in a in a, a work group kind of fashion rather than an open meeting so that spreadsheet you showed Steph is that like the document that we'd be filling out maybe Maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be happy to meet with you and Andrew. And if there's anybody else who wants to take a leadership role, like act as a team lead or something to make sure that we format a document so it's useful for you all. I added some fields in there like, um, you know, do, are there any um, maintenance needs? 
sorry, um, maintenance, maintenance needs um, and or just like general thoughts about, you know, how you feel about this piece. Um, but there may be other fields that you all think need to be on there. So, yeah. That's, you know, some of these pieces too, they don't um, exist sort of in a solitary fashion. They are designed as part of the urban trail or they are they are designed to link to another thing. So having those right. connections between items would be important to record as well. And, and having, you know, you did the, the assessment of at least the pieces on the urban trail um, already for maintenance needs, you know, having what those were a few years ago for us to check and see what they look like now on yeah. the spreadsheet when we do our, would be great. Okay, so um, let's, uh, if everybody puts on their calendar that uh, weather permitting, I think the next meeting of the Public Art and Cultural Commission looks like it's going to be um, downtown on Pack Square. Sounds okay. good. The last time we got together in person and walked around, I thought it was really helpful and effective. I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, yeah, there's some things that you just have to be on the ground for. This is one of them. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a great plan. You know, a really good photographer, too. I could pick some nice picture for us. Hint, hint, Reggie. <laughs> <It's pretty fun. laughs> yeah, I'm down. Absolutely. All right. It sounds like we're all in agreement. Are we ready to move on to the next item? The only, the only thing I would ask of Steph is that is that what you are looking to get out of us uh, at this point, or would you need any do you need any further like direction or answer questions answered um, from this item? Um, that is a great question, actually. No, that's that's what I think I need to be able to move forward. Is uh, you guys are wanting to do this, and I can meet with uh, you, the the chair and the vice chair, to uh, formalize what we're going to do is our plan, our strategy. Sounds good. Great. Um, uh, would you mind sharing that spreadsheet uh, with us uh, so that we can start sort of playing with like columns or just like what, yes. trying to scope out what we want to record? Yeah, everybody should add things on it and, and not, you know, don't worry about it at all. Just put stuff on there and we'll clean it up later. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thanks you. Thank you, Andrew, for heading this up. Um, from the board perspective. Okay, so moving on to the temporary public art program. I'm super, super excited to hear more about this. So Carly, if you want to take it away. All right. Right, is everybody able to see my screen? Good to go, all right. Okay, so hello everyone, happy Thursday. Um, I'm here with a few updates on the temporary art program in Pack Square Plaza. So today I'm going to review the framework and the timeline that we discussed at our last meeting and then also do a recap of the questions and answers that we went through at our last meeting. And then introduce the program elements that myself and Steph and the team have been developing and talking about over the past few weeks. And then end with next steps. So as we talked about last time, uh, thinking about the public art program for Pack Square Plaza in, in two steps or phases with this call for temporary art running concurrently with the, the visioning process um, that Steph is heading up and with the RFP that the proposals do on February 21st. So we're really hoping that this call for temporary art and the engagement and the artwork that we get from this being very valuable um, pieces of information that will end up informing that visioning uh, document and then the more permanent things and changes and elements that may 
become a part of Pack Square Plaza in the future. So similar to some of the discussion that we were having at the last meeting, I think we're seeing this temporary art as sort of a testing ground for those more permanent solutions. And this is an overview of the timeline that we're thinking about, very much a draft. I basically have just shifted everything a little bit to the right from last time, uh, since those RFPs are now gonna be due on February 21st instead of the 11th. So this is going to be a moving sort of in flux um, timeline, but the basic idea here, once again, that that first temporary art installation happening in the midst of the visioning project and then community engagement um, for, that, for that project and effort. So now I'm gonna look at the survey questions. So for this one, two words that you'd like to describe a su successful temporary public art project or program, lots of words thrown out here, but ones that stuck out to me, accessible, current, relevant, and attention grabbing. And then two short-term goals for this temporary public art program. Once again, a lot of great feedback, but some of the ones that stood out to me were responsive to the moment, inclusive, reflective, and interactive. And interactivity has been a theme through a lot of the responses that we got um, in these survey questions from you all. Long-term goals, uh, the results being community supported, representative of the culture and context of the area, the history, uh, a clear and streamlined process for applicants and timeless. And then when asking about the criteria that is the most important when evaluating temporary art proposals, um, most of you said that it should engage the community and have that interactive element to it with uh, being led by BIPOC artists, being a close second um, quality of art and the artist or group being local, being things called out as important as well. Most everyone agreed that it would be criti critically important to have a stipend or funding provided as part of this to, to the applicant. And then most everyone agreed that the call for art shouldn't be a, a rolling ongoing thing, that it should have an open date and a closed date. And I think we talked about that being making a lot of sense just with staff resources and not wanting to stretch ourselves too thin. All right. So looking at these program elements next, these are things that we've been talking about and developing as part of this program. And I split them into six categories, uh, thinking about the theme for the call to art, the location, who can apply and be involved, uh, what type of art, what does that entail, the process, and then the criteria that the, the proposals will be evaluated on. So we took all of your all's great feedback and, and also the feedback from our speakers last month to, to really dive into this in more detail. And I'm gonna pause after each of these categories or elements um, and basically ask for your all's feedback at that point. I'm hoping to get some discussion going back and forth. I might have some specific questions or it might just be a general, what do you think? All right, so thinking about the theme and the questions, this is what we want all proposals to address in some form or fashion. And they, we'd also like for them to answer the, the following questions. So the theme being social equity and inclusion, um, questions to answer through the art, what should this space look and feel like in the future, and what stories aren't being told in downtown Asheville or in Pack Square Plaza currently. So I'm going to pause there and see if anybody has any thoughts on that, if they feel like that encompasses the call and the mission for, for this particular program. Any thoughts? Any feedback? 
Hi, Carly. Um, uh, I, have a, I have a question. Um, uh, I'm thinking about the, the complete life cycle of these objects. And if they are temporary, they're really just temporary in this location. Well, we wouldn't expect that they would go to the landfill after this. So um, if they're going to be temporary here, is there, um, is there a, 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 what is the next phase of life for them? Is that, uh, would that be part of the call that there's an expectation that after it's in this area that we, that there, that there is a defined home for it. Cause I, I know that with the, the beautiful art that was, um, uh, that was created out of a lot of the, uh, during the protests on the border, on the plywood, um, everybody kind of had to scramble to think, well, how do we, how do we go on with these objects now that they exist? Um, so is that, is that good? Can we build that into the call? Um, is that something appropriate? I think that's actually something that we talk about a little bit later when we're talking about criteria um, and expectations for applicants. So one of the things that we really want to get from this process is a, a capture um, and recording of, of the piece of art or the performance or the pop-up and the type of community feedback and engagement that comes from that. So that could be photos, video, notes, any of that, but that's a requirement that we're gonna have of applicants. And then with the idea of, of starting an archive online of, of all these pieces of art. And the type of art that we're calling for is also pretty loose. I mean, it could be a physical piece or it could be a moment or a, a performance. Uh, we're leaving that open at this point, though that's something that we can discuss more. Yeah, go ahead, Katie. I'll just say what made the protest art so complicated is the plywood was donated um, and the artists donated their time. And so there was no clear sense of who owned the pieces. Whereas with these pieces, we'll know who owns them and, you know, it'll be that organization that's presenting it. And so it won't be so such a gray area um, like we've dealt with um, the protest murals. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So thinking about location. So what the staff and I came to a consist consensus around more or less was that it should be anywhere in Pack Square Plaza minus obvious areas like private property, uh, the fountain is off limits and then areas that would just make it impossible for pedestrians or accessibility. And the main thing being you know, if an artist or an applicant comes in and has, you know, or is inspired by a, a place in this plaza that's not listed in one of these four four places that are called out, you know, we're, we'd be willing to work with them to see how we can make that happen. So these aren't the only locations, but these are just set out a start um, for that. So the elevated uh, grassy birch plaza, the area around the seat wall to the north of the square, the area around the monument, that median space, and then the bullseye at the corner um, down towards Market Street were areas that staff, you, you know, are just initially looked at and thought, I think these could house some sort of public art or um, performance. So once again, I'll pause and see if anybody has any other thoughts or places we should explore if we've missed something. Is Biltmore supportive of having these projects right there in front of them? So the area that I've designated on here is not on Biltmore's property from as far as I can tell, we're gonna have to dive into the details a little bit more and look exactly where that property line is. And our intention is to talk with Biltmore too and make sure that we're coordinating with them before making any final decisions. I, I really like the map but um, some of it is aspirational. Uh, the 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 sketch. It, it, I noticed that um, you know the the where the location of the trees and a little a little traffic island um, doesn't actually exist um, on the site. Um, so I, I'm just kind of wondering why. It's a really lovely sketch, and I. It's an yeah, Andrew. It's yeah. an old map. It's from the original design. Thank you. Thank you. I was like, 
Um, uh, it's, it was so, so a previous aspiration, not a current aspiration. Um, yeah, and I okay. did mention that um, in the, the first time I did this presentation, and this was the site plan from 2003. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm mainly using it just because of the clarity of the image. Um, the other drawings that we have are like technical drawings with lines and tempo and stuff all over them, but noted. And okay. I will make sure and create a map that is up to date before we launch this. I, I I just thought it was cool and I wondered about it. Thank you. Oh yeah, sure. I think this is yeah. great. Oh, oh, sorry. oh, go ahead, Allie. Oh, I just wanted to ask about the the street itself, since that was the site of the the um, Black Lives Matter the painting right on the street itself. Is that going to be an option for people if they wanted to do like some temporary painting on the street in that sense, like the mural? We talked about that a lot, actually. Um, and I think that the future of that Black Lives Matter mural is still under discussion. So we want to let those discussions kind of unfold and figure out what's going to happen with that before saying yes or no. I, I think that the streets and the crosswalks around this area are great canvases for any sort of public art that and I'm sure would inspire a lot of um, conversation. So, yeah, I think to be determined, but we're definitely talking about that. And I, I would like to be able to include that in this call in some form. I was just going to ask about events and festivals. This area is used a lot for festivals. Mm -hmm. And how will the temporary public art program work with all the festival events? So when we do the call, I talk about this a little bit later um, in some of the, the elements on the next slide. I think that that is going to have to be carefully um, scheduled and maneuvered with staff. We're going to have to do a lot of coordination with other departments and make sure that we understand when things are happening in the plaza. So yes, that, that will be um, a challenge, but one that I think that we can work, work out. You know, depending on the art, um, it could be an opportunity as well. That's true. So I, 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 I can see a coordination challenge with that. But if it was a performance piece and there was a compatible mm -hmm. event, um, that could there could be a really amazing audience and presence for that built in to it. It could be part. It could be sort of co-programmed with whoever has that outdoor um, event permit. So yeah, absolutely. Something, something to consider. Obviously, not all combinations of things would work, but there are some that could be amazing. So let's let's keep the that let's keep that door open for the artist and the the event uh, permit holder. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's a great point. Okay, I'm gonna move to the next one here. So talking about who, um, individuals of age, uh, nonprofits, private entities. And then we felt that the applicant must be affiliated with the arts, be an artist or designer or in that field or a related field of some sort, or um, call out that they are going to partner with an artist or designer because we want for this to be geared towards and supporting artists as, as part of this call. And then also that the applicant must be connected to Buncombe County in some way. And I think we were, that's something I would like your all's feedback on is like, what, how do we define that association or connection with Buncombe County? We were thinking they don't necessarily have to be located in Buncombe County. There could be a history or an interest or other tie. Um, but I'd be interested to hear what you all think about this. Yes, Shirley. I have a question I, I guess is related. Uh, if you look at the picture where the boys are on the base of the monument, you have a lot of uh, people speaking there and they the sidewalks and it could be dangerous. Will you have a, like a little stage if people want to protest or have a concern, not competing with the other park, but a place for people to stand back from this curving so no one will get hurt. You understand what I'm talking about? Kind of. I, I guess you're just talking about if if the performance or the piece of art draws a crowd, how are we going to keep people safe in and, the right of way? And is that, is that what you're asking? People have gone 
to that spot to protest. That's a central location. Mm -hmm. And I watch the people on the news, uh, double LOS, when they're protesting. And if you uh, look the sidewalk around the fence, they're standing around in that area. And if you're thinking about designing something for the future, will you be able to design it so if people want to go protest or bring up an uh, issue, they will be inside the design and not at the sidewalk and get hit or something. I was just thinking about safety. Yeah, no, I think that's like a great a point. Concrete or something for them to be seen uh, in, in the uh, design for the future. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think that's something that will come up during that visioning process and thinking about the future improvements for the plaza and how to make this space really work for how the community wants to, to use it and engage with it. So I think that's definitely something that's gonna need to be addressed and discussed during that. Um, did you have another comment, Shirley? I was trying to put my hand down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me click again. Okay, I think that's it, yeah. Okay, does anybody else have any comments or thoughts on this one? Remind me again how the selection process for these are going to work. So I get into that a little bit later. Okay. I guess the reason I, I bring that up is, that, you know, I think it's great to leave it open-ended and let people make an argument um, for why they're connected to Buncombe County. Okay. That's kind of, that's how we were feeling too, but we wanted to get, to get your all's thoughts and feedback on that as well. well and I think uh, uh, if, you know, you, you should have a compelling connection to Buncombe County. So then they know that they'll need to talk about what that is as a way to field it. Just yeah. Compelling. I like that. And I think the main, another main thing here for the who is that we want to make sure that the applicants, you know, are going to be able to work with the materials, install, and maintain a safe exhibit in a public space. So we're wanting some demonstration too that they're capable of of pulling this off and understand what it means to work in a in a public space. Okay, and then the what? So we're we want to leave it open to traditional artwork non-traditional artwork, virtual augmented reality, uh, experiences and performances. Uh, we want the art to address the theme and answer the questions that we mentioned a few slides ago uh, with everybody wanting a stipend to be included. And we agree with that. Uh, what we were thinking was up to 1500 per applicant and that kind of being a, a range. So based on a proposed budget that would be a part of the application process and complexity of the project, it could fall anywhere in that range. And then trying to think about, you know, when we're talking about events being scheduled and some of this artwork being maybe just a couple hours versus some that may need to be there for up to three months or more. Um, we wanted to provide time limit categories. So during the application pro process, they could check off, you know, we want a weekend for this particular artwork or piece of art. And then to think about like staff capacity and resources, we wanted to put a max number of those that we would accept during this round or call. So the categories we split up into two days or less and that we would accept up to five of those one to two weeks, we'd accept up to three to those, of those, and then one to six months, select up to two. Once again, preliminary, this is us just kind of trying to put something out there that and get reactions from, from you all and from other staff, but this is initially what we were thinking. And when we were thinking about the definition of what temporary meant in this context, uh, six months was what came to mind. But once again, would love to get everybody's thoughts and initial reactions to this. Um, I think it would be good if there was maybe a nonprofit rate or a rate for youth leadership or like elementary or high school, you know, performances. <clears throat> 
and for um, like Buncombe County local residents or maybe city of Asheville residents, something like that. Marsha, this is stuff. Do you mean that they get more money if, because the $1,500 is what we would be paying them, not what they'd be charging? Oh, okay. Well, I, I misunderstood that. Okay. I was like, $1,500 an applicant. No, no, no. <laughs> like, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, that was if this, you this just stipend. read the languaging and you miss that bit, um, I was like, I okay. Yeah. So we would be, yeah, we would be providing that stipend. Yeah. I wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can see how that is confusing for the way that that's listed up there. I think it would also be helpful to be able to get a quote on materials per applicant because that's going to determine, you know, how big or small is the project, how much will the artist walk away with, and to make sure that we're being thoughtful about that component of the spend. Yeah. Also, maintenance. Katie knows about that. <laughs> maintenance of a public art piece. Yes. Okay. That's an important part point, Marcia, is you know, if it's gonna be there for up to six months, there will have to be some maintenance done probably. So that's a scheduling issue for staff as well to think mm -hmm. about. Okay, that's all great feedback. Um I I would suggest that the um uh, stipend ceiling be a little higher okay um because i'm you know i'm thinking of hey i play in a six-piece band um i don't think that if we had or or another band would have to had a of professional artists and musicians that want to do this that that ceiling would probably make me not even apply um okay that's good so i it's not that so i, I think it might and for a, for a larger group project like that, uh, for for that type of performance, um, we might that amount might filter out some folks that otherwise might do it. Okay. I mean, the, it, I was at the symphony Saturday night, and they had two amazing pieces by Black composers. But the symphony, I don't think, would ever look at that and say we could pull this off um, for for that. So um, you know, they're somebody who might, you know, they, they're up with a potential applicant that I would I would want to have in the running if they were interested. I wouldn't want that to be their barrier, I mean, so. Um. That's a really good point, Andrew. Um, you know, you mentioned that this would be a sliding scale. Um, and like, how is that being determined? I'm guessing it won't be based on how long the piece is in place. Um, how, how will you determine how people, how much of the stipend people receive? And another point to that, what Andrew was saying about live performances in that 1500 marker, not only are they going to have to pay the artist, but sound is a big monetary cost as well. Yeah, those are all good points. And so I, I think we need to go back and, and look at what that number should be or the high end of what that range should be, taking all this into account. Um, I don't know. I'm going to need to also work with Steph to understand what our max budget is that we can allocate to this. So, and, and then thinking about that, the range, and then the number of applications that we're going to select, we'll have to make sure that those that those align and that we're not um, overstepping our budget here. <laughs> so, I think that's good feedback, and we'll go back and and look at it again. Steph, I don't know if you have any words of wisdom on on budget or amounts or you you nailed it we'll go back and look okay. um, right now this is what we had but you know this is what worked with the budget that we have always I mean, want more money <laughs> there, oh of course and I, I mean my my thought would be if you had to go with fewer and better uh, because of budget constraints then that's gonna that i think that'll have more public impact mm -hmm. um, actually okay yeah, I agree with that, Andrew. But more and better is also good. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, arguments can be made both ways. But I think it's important. I mean, to build on Andrew's point that because we had talked in the feedback that we wanted it to have impact. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, if budget pushes us back into decisions or prioritization, fewer, bigger, more impactful pieces would surely be something we'd want to think about. Because your point's right, Carly. We gotta, we've got to work backwards from the money and then work forward from the applicants and options that are in front of us. 
Just to play devil's advocate, is that an equity issue by limiting it to fewer opportunities? Are we, you know, making it less accessible for people to have an opportunity in the space as well? So that's something else to consider. Yeah, all very good points. I, I will add this one last thing is, and that is that um, there is an additional budget that is set aside to actually market these, uh, uh, this temporary public art program and the artists and their work being displayed. So it wouldn't just be like it went up and nobody heard about it. Um, so uh, we're hoping to balance the fact that there's not a lot of money associated with people doing it with the opportunity for people to um, have their artwork seen and perhaps be in the newspaper or um, maybe even a larger publication. Okay, does anybody have any final comments on this? Yeah, I wonder if it's worth just asking people, like, I don't know, Andrew, what what would your band get paid to play and if they perform? You know, maybe just see if we can get some numbers of, like, what would be yeah. appropriate from people who do these kinds of things. Not just bands, but, you know, approach an artist and ask them. Because I have no idea. Yeah, well, it seems low, but... <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's not, you know... If, I'm thinking. I'm thinking of just using myself as an example in my band. I know, hey, to to plan and program something would be a tremendous amount of time for whoever's taking the artistic leadership role, and then you have to pay your subcontractors that actually execute the performance. So, um, so it's it's you know it's always. I don't want to get into like a my entire bidding philosophy right now, but it's important to it's important to. To, to think about the hours for something that of that you'd have to prepare of a you know that's going to have to be a very thoughtful and sensitive nature just to get the philosophical underpinnings of how to approach something in this location with these you know um and then you actually have to 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 execute it um and so there's be a lot of different pieces of expenses possibly and um so would 1500 maybe work for a performance fee? Yeah, but that wouldn't pay the hours of time to build it, to get it there, to conceive of it, to um, do your research, um, and to um, all the time it would take to meet with members of the community that you'd want to have input on it. So, um, so there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different pieces of uh, that. And um, if we want, if we expect that work to be done, then uh, the ceiling needs to be a little higher, I think. Okay. As staff, I'll just say the one last thing is I, I'm, I'm hearing you and I'm also thinking that maybe we can try to find some partners in the community that can help um, pay to make this a better program. This is what's dawning on me. Like right now, I don't, I don't know that we have the budget to do, um, to do it. And yeah, Ali. Yeah, Ali's thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> exactly. This is. Let's, we'll we'll offline. We'll basically see if there's a way for us to maybe look and see if people. I mean, even if there were three or four organizations that would be able to give small sums of money, we'd be able to do something. Yeah, um, that, that would make really a difference. People. I think there's a major arts organization in that area. Hmm. <laughs> this is a grant-funded oh. arts organization who <laughs> probably has their budget already dedicated. This is Shirley. Um, we have a jazz band, and right now uh, we have Clifford Cotton, and he's part of the history of the jazz band, I mean, of the band that started Stevens Lee, and he's in his 80s. He's working with our jazz band. He just want to be a part of it. And then we have another, uh, Anthony Griffin, and they volunteer, so the kids are learning with them. And I know our jazz band would love to participate, and we wouldn't expect $1,500, but we would need transportation to get there. Uh, the exposure, and remember, we have young people, and later on they're going to be our adults, and uh, they have performed in the community, um, preservation hall and all. And they're working on some special music. 
So I hope when you think about entertainment and uh, doing something during that time, we won't forget the youth. That's a good point, Shirley. Um, Carly, we're running a little long. Just so okay. you know, we probably need to wrap this up. All right, thank you for that note. So I'll just quickly go through these. Once again, this, this is early in the drafting stage. Um, the idea is to take feedback from today and put this into a more formal document, call for artists and um, program elements, and then send it to the committee for, for review so you can have more time with it. Uh, so we're thinking no application fee, the, that the call will open and close on specified dates and be open for around a month. Uh, trying to capture four weekends in there. We want to put together a selection committee that will be made up of uh, relevant city staff, PAC commissioners, and then key stakeholders and give, you know, after the submission closed, you know, give about three weeks to, to review and analyze. And of course, city reserving the right to recommend changes to comply with code and safety requirements. And then looking at criteria, so criteria that would be used uh, by the committee to evaluate the proposals. So alignment with the theme and the questions, the amount of community engagement and inclusiveness in the creation and implementation, the level of interactivity um, of the piece, the inclu being inclusive of the context and the history, the quality of the submission and the execution, and then originality and creativity. And then other criteria to consider or that they would have to check off is no infrastructural impact. So it has to be reversible or removable, has to be developed, installed, performed, maintained, and removed without staff assistance. And then, as I'd mentioned earlier, we want all funded applicants to supply documentation of the completed artwork so that we can archive this and that this can really be a part of what goes into the engagement for the visioning process and the future of Pack Square Plaza. So thinking now in the next one to two weeks, um, I'd like to identify some PAC members who'd like to be on this selection committee and help develop the program further. Um, and then also identify those staff members and stakeholders that are gonna be key uh, to that selection committee and partnering with to make this a success. And then in the next month, drafting that call, fleshing out the program elements and getting review and comments from you all and from those stakeholders. And then two to three months, release the call for art and plan to have that first temporary art exhibit up by early spring, concurrent with that visioning and community engagement process for Pack Square Plaza. So that is all I have. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Well, that was a lot, and that was yeah. a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank um, you. What I'll say is we have a subcommittee for Pat Plaza already. Um, okay. Three members. That, so I'd like to give them the opportunity first to participate if they'd like. So that's Reggie, Pete, and Jasmine. Okay. Anybody else have quick final thoughts before we move on to our next items? Um, I noticed the bit about no staff assistance. Um, I, obviously, there must be a carve out for if the road closure was required and you had to put up a barrier or something like that. Like, is that? Yes, I think what we meant by that was that you have to be able to pull off the piece independently of staff. Like, we're not going to help you build it or take it down. But yes, we'll help with permitting needed, street closures, that sort of thing. And of course, we can make that very clear. Um, in the call okay. and in the outline of the program. Just just wanted to check. Thank you. I was just going to say, I, I appreciate the work that you've done. You've done a good job of really shaping this for a path here that we can grab and move forward because this could have been something we just got bogged down in and just appreciate your work. Thank you. All right. Well, to be continued, I'm going to turn it back over to the chair or staff. Thank you, Carly. So what we have next on our uh, continued business items is other discussion, potential action items. Steph, would you like to explain what you were thinking about that? 
Yes. So this is a time just before we leave the PAC Square Improvements Project discussion for you to say, you know what I thought of since we last met? Here's what we we need to um, here's what we need to do. It's just a catch all in case you all have any comments for us about the project or what we need to be thinking about next. I have something if nobody else does. Okay. Um, so the Arts Council right now is doing a virtual exhibition of the storefront protest murals, and part of that is a three part speaker series. And yesterday was the second one of those talks and it was focused on BIPOC public artists in Asheville and what came of that discussion um, that I really think this group needs to consider um, is the need for more education on how to do public art um, and so I think that's an action item we should add to the list I think it'll be important as we move through this so we can make sure there is access for everybody to take part in this opportunity um, to have some training done around this Anyone okay. else? Okay. Okay. Next, um, we have project and committee updates. Um, so Joanna is uh, not with us today. Steph, are you able to give an update on the Broadway Public Safety Station, or should we skip that? For now? I, I'm able to give an update. Oh, I think, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm reporting out for Joanna and also Nicole George, who works for. Um, the city of Asheville and is managing the Broadway Public Safety Station Public Art Project. Um, the the group, uh, the, the Artist Selection Committee has met one time and I heard that they had a great meeting and here are a couple things. Um, they are getting ready to release a call for artists. It'll The call will be released pretty soon, like probably in the next week or two, and it will be due, or well, maybe two weeks, uh, due the end of March or beginning of April. So we will let you know as soon as that happens. Um, the call is going to be uh, for artwork that can carry the ethos that contains and references the ethos of public safety. So the ethos is described as... Um, have valuing community first and uh, service to others and supporting uh, others. So it doesn't have to directly reference fire or the police or anything like that, but um, that is the ethos that they're looking for. And they are um, leaving it open to a variety of media mediums and also saying that it could be one or several pieces on site. And there is uh, the compensation is up to eighty four thousand dollars for the successful applicant. So let's make sure um, that we provide that opportunity out there for as many pieces of people as possible. And I'll be do my part by letting you know uh, when that is going to be advertised. That's awesome. Does anybody have any questions about the project before we move on? Okay. Steph, it's on you again. We're going to talk about the urban trail next. Okay. So my part of this is just to uh, let you know that we are still um, working on some design concepts for the Art Deco masterpiece reinstallation. That is the marker that honors the SNW building. It actually honors um, Ellington as an architect and uh, his um, efforts uh, in our community. So uh, the, the concepts that we're looking at are not only um, how we're going to take that mosaic that was once in a wall and put that into a, a marker, but also how we would be looking at the area more through a placemaking lens and less through a historic sign uh, and, and urban trail marker lens. So that's, um, we're, we're doing a lot of due diligence, including um, the other day, Carly and I met with the owners of the Wells Fargo building to better understand what some of their concerns were and you know they're very um they love Asheville and they're very uh, much looking forward to um, working on the project in any way that they can so um slow and steady was the race on that one awesome um next is um reinterpreting three stations on the urban trail and I this is on the agenda because I just wanted to remind the group 
that when we did our field trip of stations in downtown, we called out three of the urban trail stations in particular that are on Market and Eagle Street as ones that really needed some to be readdressed or rethought. Um, and those three are the block, black art, our brick artisan and hotel district. Oh. And so as we do this inventory um, at our next meeting, those are three stations in particular that I would like you to really think about as we go through the process. Um, we talked about, you know, the plaques needing to be redone and, and rewritten. We also had concerns about the visibility of the pieces. And there were even some thoughts about, do these pieces need to be redone completely? Like, are they still relevant for the story that they're trying to tell? Um, so I just wanted to call that out and ask you all to think about that as we do the inventory um, at our next meeting. Um, next item on the agenda is the uh, RAD Public Art Walking Tour app. And um, turn that over to Steph again. Yeah, so just as a reminder for folks, about a year ago, we started working on a walking tour that you could access through um, a smartphone. And this was part of the River Arts District uh, grand opening for the Wilma Dykeman Riverway and all the rad tip improvements. We needed to put it on hold because we didn't have the resources um, that uh, on hand to execute the project. We got about half of it done. And if you actually watch the panel um, yesterday, so some of it was referenced, right? Uh, Cliesta said, yeah, I did a recording for it. And she, she did. And Dwayne actually worked with us to um, write that recording and we still need to record it with him. But um, the idea is that um, we are going to be highlighting not only the spaces where some public art exists, whether that's public art that is part of the city's public art collection or it's public art that just part of the public realm. Like some of you may know there's the coolest ever mural of a groundhog on the old um, Riverlink, they don't own it anymore, but um, where the old cotton mill site was. So we're gonna be highlighting all of that kind of stuff, including um, foundation walls. And we have recordings with different people. And on, um, Carly's taking, the, taking that ball, um, a beautiful yarn up, and she can give us an update as to where we are right now. Sure, so we have a handy dandy beautiful, I guess, spreadsheet <laughs> that has been put together and we're checking off all of the points of interest that we want included on this tour. And there were a few that still needed audio recording. So Steph and I have been working to, um, you know, get meetings set up with the people that need to do the, the recordings and, and get them to, to say their piece. We're also gathering photos of the art pieces that will be a part of the, the virtual tour. And then I am working on the contract as well. And so I have a first draft of that ready to go. And we just need to review that with Autocast and then start pushing it through the, the city process to get that approved. So we're making, making progress. One of the things I'm most excited about is that once it's up and running, we can see how it's used and um, potentially use it in our Pack Square Improvements project to tell stories about some of the objects in the public realm there. So hopefully you guys will all, once it's done, um, go down and take the tour. That sounds awesome. When, when do you think it might be finished? I think I set a date of March 1st March for it to be launched. Yeah. Wow, that's quick. That's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in yeah. March. Yeah, in March. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you been this. all these years, Carly? <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. My life is so much better with Carly Stevenson in it. <laughs> it is. It's really, I've, I've been wanting you to get some great help for a long time, Steph. So great. I'm excited really nice. to be here. <laughs> We can feel it. I mean, our last two meetings have been awesome. Yeah. We're a breath of fresh air. All right. We have made it to public comment. Do we have any? We do not have any public comment, Chair. Okay. So we'll move on to other updates and announcements. Um, so, Steph, do you want to speak for a moment about the board and commission restructuring proposal? 
Yeah, I, I what I want you to know is that uh, the city of Asheville, after discussions with staff and city council members and upon input from different members of board and commissions, has been creating uh, a bit of a framework to think about how we could make boards and commissions work better. So we have been hearing about how they've been working poorly for many years. And we also know, because sometimes they do work very well, the parts that are, um, the parts that are working. So um, the city of Asheville has uh, done two focus groups with board chairs and, vi and board vice chairs to um, roll out kind of an initial, kind of what Carly did basically to say, here's an initial proposal of what we think would work and would an answer some of the questions that you all have been asking us for years. Like how can we have a better relationship you know, with city council and have more direct impact? How can city council know what we're doing? How can we understand what our roles are in a um, better way? How can we get better staff support? All those different things. So there was a proposal that was rolled out and is now up um, on, there's a citypublicinput.com page. So if you go to the city's um, publicinput.com page and I'll, I'll, um, I'll find the link for you uh, right now. Um, you can find all of the information about it. There's even an email where you can say, here's what I think about the proposal, but you may want to wait because there is going to be a larger community engagement process around um, what eventually, what is going to be the final version of this proposal. So, and I, to be honest with you, I have not been able to read the information that has just been released. So I do not know what that, um, I don't know what their process looks like. Uh, just was a little busy the last couple of days. So, um, but it, it's kind of exciting and um, potentially, um, you know, it could be like exciting anxious or exciting opportunity, maybe both, uh, for us to have a conversation about what civic engagement and how we value our boards and commissions and um, uh, what we are going to do moving forward. So I think that it should be said, right, because there is information out there that the general proposal is to minimize the number of boards and, and commissions um, so that in a way that makes them mirror the structure of the council boards and commissions, but they still have all of the authority of all the subject matter areas that our current board and commissions would have. They would just address those subject matter areas through stand, like through working committees or task force um, that are more directly connected to city council. So, um, Instead of having like some of the boards and commissions, first of all, would never go away or because they're um, chartered by the state. So planning and zoning, that is a, a function by law we have to have performed. And so everybody, every municipality is going to have a P and Z board. Uh, but in the case of having like an urban forestry commission and a SACI and a human relations commission, you know, human relations committee and this, that, and the other thing, we're thinking about asking people to, to work more holistically um, and then break out into certain, certain topic areas. I don't know if that's the right way to do it. It certainly is a great conversation starter though. It's been fabulous. All the people who are now super engaged about how to make boards and commissions great Thank you in advance for your participation. I And I will let you know, um, like I think Katie and Andrew, you've already participated in an initial focus group, right? Yes. I, 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 I really wasn't able to fully attend because I had a rehearsal at exactly the same time. So oh, okay. I, okay, I, well, I, I, did my, I did my best to tune in while I was playing piano, but I didn't get everything. <laughs> okay. So I was there and, um, you know, we got it. Right after that meeting, um, I sent all of the PAC members an email um, just giving you an overview of what had been discussed and giving you the materials from the meeting. Um, so I put it in the chat and, um, you know, it is publicly available on all the city social media. They've been sharing out this public input page that you can go to to find out more about the proposal. Um, but they have a series of four workshops coming up. There are, are opportunities for you to hear firsthand about what's being proposed and give your input as well. So I really encourage all PAC members to try and participate in at least one um, and hear what's being proposed and definitely give your feedback. Um, now is the time to speak up. 
Katie posted this. I'm going to say it um, so that people who are watching can hear it. It is the, the website is publicinput.com backslash C1401. That's where you'll go. Thank you, Katie, for doing that. I'm, uh, I, I, I've, uh, I've made no secret about my distaste in the process of this plan. Uh, in my opinion, the boards and commissions do absolutely need work. Um, and I really appreciate seeing the um, our the Public Art and Cultural Commission, um, you know, get resources that help make that help make the advice real from an advisory position. And I really, I it's so much it's so much progress just having a little bit more staff time um, to work on to work on this stuff. So it's really appreciated when the city maintains the things they build well, if they function well. And I'm a little concerned that's part of the city's desire to renovate or demolish some of these boards and current art and commissions comes from the lack of maintenance that they've put into them, not from the lack of dedication from the volunteer people like us that have come there to help. Um, and I'm a little concerned that the plan seems to already have a landing point, very pretty staked out going from 20 to four um, and uh the is is pretty concerning to me I, it feels like um i'm not uh you know i think a better process would been to say like have, have, have been to start this conversation without that landing point defined already because now we have to talk about the land is the landing point the right thing we don't get to talk about what the current conditions are what's working what's not working so it's i think it's a big distraction and that the the city proposal made a huge mistake in um, defining the end point in that way. Even if it's not a fixed end point, I think even defining it has damaged the conversation a lot. And um, I appreciate the update, Steph, and I know this isn't coming from you, and you're the you're the messenger on, on this in a lot of ways. Um, and I hope that we can have this conversation without having an end point because, uh, defined, because we're going to get better, we're going to give and get better advice um, if we can if we can do it that way. Thanks, Andrew. Allie, did you have something you wanted to say? Well, it's kind of a moot point now, but I was going to ask, I got contacted by um, Brooke Randall at Express and maybe other people did too about um, giving some quotes for an interview. And I wanted to know about sort of the permission, like obviously I'd be speaking for myself, right, in my own experiences. And I just want to be careful about that. But I just saw that I was supposed to answer it by noon and I didn't do that. So <laughs> I guess never mind. <laughs> Yeah, so you just can't speak on behalf of the Public Art and Cultural Commission. You can definitely speak your views. Well, I'm pretty tired. She probably won't get it from me today. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about it? What's happened, or, you know, what's being proposed so far? Okay. Well, and, you know, as we find out more, we'll share. I'll be sure to share it and make sure you're informed as we move forward. Okay, um, so I have next support for the African American Heritage Commission funding. Is that you again, Steph? You know what, Shirley, when you were talking about the jazz band, you mentioned Anthony, and I was like, he's related to Aaron Griffin, right? Yeah, he's talking. Pat Griffin's uncle, a uh, cousin. Okay. Uh, Gary, they've been working with the kids. He's a Jace uh, bass guitar player, and then Clifford Carden is playing the saxophone. And they go way back, and this is part of the history that they're researching now. These are actual people who were part of it, Stevens Lee. And I know Carden is in his 80s, and he just wanted to do it to be a part of it. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Aaron is the new chair of the African American Heritage uh, Commission. And so connecting the dots here is going to be fun and um, probably pretty easy. But as some of you may remember, woo, bef the January before the pandemic hit, the PAC uh, they approved a resolution, you all, but not necessarily you if you weren't on it, approved a resolution to provide $10,000 of funding to the African American Heritage Commission um, to explore and or develop a monument, memorial, or piece of public art around the African American experience in downtown Asheville. So um, a lot has happened since then. 
a lot, a lot, a lot has happened since then. So it's time for us to revisit that. And what I'm hoping to do is maybe get a group of people together um, from the African American Heritage Commission to come to one of your meetings and have a conversation about whether or not they still want to consider using that funding or if they have other needs at this point. And I just, before I um, made any um, invites to Aaron and his group, I just thought I would ask people if they have any comments or questions that we could think about before getting together. I think that sounds great, Steph. I'll mention that both Aaron and I are serving on the advisory committee for the African American Heritage Trail together. So I just got to meet him um, last week. Uh, and uh, I believe that Explore Asheville will be coming to join one of our upcoming meetings soon to give us an update on what's happening with the African American Heritage Trail. That's great. So um, maybe we can kind of combine those things and we can do some planning um, so, uh, if, if our March meeting is going to be on site, maybe this is our April meeting. Okay. Thank you. Lots of good stuff today. Anybody got anything else? All right. Well, we're going to set you I would like to ask oh, good. questions, information only. Okay. Uh, Claire's the cotton create a work of art for a hotel. If Delta House created a work of art and we're a nonprofit tax exempt, is it con and we say it's public, would we be considered? I know something came up and they said Claire's the work could not be included in the public arts because it's on private property. But uh, our facility is open for the community. And also, if we apply it for the public arts project with Z Smith Reynolds, right. I'm trying to find out if we say, say if we're one of the awardees, would our work be considered public art here in the city? That's what I'm trying to find out. Because uh, you don't want to, you know, that beautiful artwork, but it's on private property. Delta House is open to the public, free. So I just want to know, would we, we be considered public art? And UNCA want to help us with the project out in the yard. So I'm asking just for information only, would we be considered public art or is that just private? So for future planning. Yeah, I'm not sure, like you're saying, would you be considered um, public art? It depends on who you're asking. So mm -hmm. if you were saying, would you be a part of the city of Asheville's public art inventory? Unless you donated that art and had it located on public property, no, it wouldn't be okay. part of the city of Asheville's public art inventory. If I you know, define public art as any historical or cultural expression that's visible from the public realm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, uh, yes, if you're, you know, in, in front of Delta House, if you put a piece of artwork up that is uh, from the sidewalk right there or the road that is, mm -hmm. you know, quite, people can visit it and enjoy it and what have you. It's technically, you know, something that can be viewed from the public realm. But I don't know what Z. Smith Reynolds thinks as public art or how they mm -hmm. define it. I know exactly what you're talking about because... Right. This is that application. I know I supported that and the right. Southside community and at Burton Street Peace Gardens and yeah. And okay. none and all of them had this similar issue. Okay. I just for information only, I just wanted to know. Thank you. Andrew? Is there a delineation between not just public accessibility but public ownership and responsibility too? Is that part of the is that part of how we how we slice it? So for, for the city of Asheville, yes. Um, and I think that for most cities, municipalities, counties, and if you have a public art collection, you um, you either um, maintain and own it and it's on public realm and, and all of that, you know, other thing. Or, I mean, it's not to say that you couldn't have a partnership with another private group who maintains those pieces of public art. So it's a little complicated, but no, like we, because we, so I put this, 
Um, you know, we have no control over whether that groundhog mural I was talking about, or maybe a better example is, you know, we actually paid to support a bunch of um, murals that were done during burners and barbecue many years ago before we built the rad tab. And the way that we supported it was actually by going and taking the walls and prepping them and making sure that they could stand up for a long, long time. But it was private property and that private property owner decided that they didn't want those murals to be upkept and they didn't want them to be ever repainted again. So that's why we didn't include it in our public art collection. When we talk about how we how we help with those types of projects and we provide opportunities, that's part of our support for a, like a different kind of public art. So you have public art and then you have the city of Asheville's public art collection. Right. Different. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? All right. If there's no further discussion, I will now uh, adjourn the meeting and live streaming can go off. Thanks. Thanks all. very much.